live from San Francisco, it's theCUBE, covering IBM Think 2019. Brought to you by IBM. Welcome back to Moscone Center, everybody. The new, improved Moscone Center. We're at Moscone North. Stop by and see us. I'm Dave Vellante. He's Stu Miniman. And Lisa Martin is here as well. John Furrier will be up tomorrow. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage. This is day zero, essentially, Stu, of IBM Think. Day one, the big keynote start tomorrow. Chairman's keynote in the afternoon. Jamie Thomas is here. She's the general manager of IBM System Strategy and Development at IBM. Great to see you again, Jamie. Thanks for coming on. Great to see you guys, as usual, and thanks for coming back to Think this year. You're very welcome. So, um, I love your new role. You get to put on the binoculars, sometimes the telescope, look at the road map. Um, you have your fingers in a lot of different areas and you get some advanced visibility on some of the yeah. things that are coming down the road. So we're really excited about that, but give us the update from you know, a year ago. You guys have been busy. We have been busy and it was a phenomenal year, uh, Dave and Stu. Uh, last year, I guess one of the pinnacles we reached is that we were named with our technology, the, we, our technology received the number one and two supercomputer ratings in the world and this was a significant accomplishment, rolling out uh, the number one supercomputer in Oak Ridge National Laboratory and the number two su supercomputer in Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. And Summit, as it's called in Oak Ridge, is really a cool system. Over 9,000 CPUs, about 27,000 GPUs. It does 200 petaflops at, at peak capacity. It has about 250 uh, petabytes of, of storage attached to it at scale. And uh, to cool this, guy, Summit, uh, I guess it's a guy, I'm not sure of the denomination actually. Uh, it takes about 4,000 gallons of water per minute uh, to cool the supercomputer, so we're, we're really pleased with the engineering that we worked on for so many years in achieving these world records, if you will, for both Summit and Sierra. Well, it's not just bragging rights either, right, Jamie? I mean, it underscores the technical competency and the challenge that you guys face. I mean. Number one and number two, that's, that's not easy. And not easy to sustain, of course, so you got to do it again. Right, right, right. it's not easy. Uh, but the good thing is the design point of these systems is that we're able to take what we created here from a technology perspective around Power9 and of course the partnership we did with NVIDIA in this case mm. and the software storage, and we're able to downsize that significantly for commercial clients. So this is the world's largest artificial intelligence supercomputer. And basically we're able to take that technology that we invented in this case, because they ended up being one of our first clients, albeit a very large client, and use that across industries to serve the needs of artificial intelligence workloads. So I think that was one of the most significant uh, elements of what we actually did here. And IBM has maintained a lot of, you know, despite you guys selling off your microelectronics division years ago, you've maintained a lot of IP in the core processing, in the design. You've also reached out, uh, certainly with Open Power, for example, to folks you mentioned NVIDIA, yeah, yeah. but having that sort of that, embracing that alternative processor mode as opposed to trying to jam everything in the die, different philosophy that IBM's taking. Yeah, we think that, uh, that workload specific processing is still very much in demand. Uh, it's, it, workloads are going to have different dimensions and that's what we really have focused on here. I don't think that this has really changed over the last decades of computing. Um, and so we're really focused on, on specialized uh, computing, purpose-built compu computing, if you will. Uh, obviously using that on premise uh, and also using that in our hybrid cloud strategies for clients that want to do that as well. What are some of the other cool things that you guys are working on that you can talk well, about? Well, I, I would say last year was quite an interesting year in that uh, from a mainframe perspective, we delivered our first 19-inch form factor, which allows us to fit you know, nicely on a floor tile. Obviously, it allows clients to scale more effectively from a data center planning perspective. Allows us to have a cl cloud footprint, uh, but with all the characteristics of security that, uh, you're, that you would normally expect in a mainframe system, but really tailored, to, tailored towards new workloads once again. So Linux form factor um, and going after the new workloads uh, that a lot of these cloud data centers really need. One of our for, first and foremost uh, focus areas continues to be security around that system. And tomorrow there'll be some announcements that'll happen around Z security. I, I can't say what they are right now, but you'll see that uh, we're extending security in new ways to support more of these hybrid cloud scenarios. 
<laughs> yeah, it, it's so funny. We, we were talking uh, in one of our earlier segments, talking about how the, the path of virtualization and, and trying to get lots of workloads into something and goes back to you know, the device that could manage all workloads, which was the mainframe. Yeah. Uh, so so you know, we've watched for many years System Z, uh, lots of Linux on there. If you want to do some cool container, you know, Global Z, you know, that's an option. So uh, it, it's interesting to watch uh, you know, while the pendulum swings in IT have happened, uh, you, you know, the, 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 the Z system has yeah, exactly. kept up with a lot of these innovations that have been going on in the industry. And, and you're right, one of our big focuses for the platform, for Z and Power, of course, is a container-based strategy. So we've created, um, uh, you know, last year we talked about secure container technology and we continue to evolve secure container technology. But the idea is we want to uh, eliminate any kind of friction from a developer perspective. So if you want to design in a container-based environment, then you're more able, easily able to port that uh, technology or your applications, if you will, to a, a Z mainframe environment if that's really what your target environment is. So that's, that's been a huge focus. Um, the other, um, of course, major invention that we announced at the uh, Consumer Electronics Show is our Quantum System 1. Hmm. And this represented a, an evol evolution of our quantum system over the last year, where we now have uh, the world's really first uh, self-contained universal quantum, quantum computer in a single uh, form factor where we were able to combine uh, the quantum processor, which is living in the dilution refrigerator. You guys remember the beautiful chandelier from last year. I think it's back this year. But this is all self-contained with its electronics in a, in, in a single form factor. And that really represents the evolution of the electronics in particular over the last year where we were able to miniaturize those electronics and, and get them into this differentiated form factor. What should people know about quantum? When you see, you know, when you see the demos, they, they, they explain it's not a binary one or a zero, it can be either, a virtually infinite set of possibilities. But what should the sort of lay person know about quantum and, and try to understand? Well, I think the, really the fundamental aspect of it is in today's world with traditional computers, they're very powerful, but they cannot solve certain problems. So when you look at areas like material science, uh, areas like chemistry, uh, even some financial trading scenarios, the problems uh, cannot either not be uh, solved at all or they cannot be completed in the right amount of time, particularly in the world of financial services. But in the, in the area of chemistry, for instance, molecular modeling, today we can model simple mo molecules, but we cannot mo model something even as complex as caffeine. We simply don't have the traditional compute capacity to do that. A quantum computer will allow us, once it comes to maturity, allow us to solve these problems that are not solvable today. And you can think about all the things that we could do if we were able to have more sophisticated molecular modeling, uh, all the kind of problems we could solve probably in the world of pharmacology, uh, material science, which affects many, many industries, right? Uh, people that are developing automobiles, people that are exploring for uh, oil, all kinds of opportunities here. In, in, in this space. Um, the technology is, is a little bit spooky, I guess, so that's what Einstein said when he first saw some of this, right? But it, it really represents the state of the universe, right? How the universe behaves today. It really is happening around us, but that's what quantum mechanics help, helps us capture, and when combined with IT technology, uh, the quantum computer can bring this to life over time. So one of the things that people point to is potentially a new security paradigm because quantum can flip the way in which we do security on its head. So you got to be thinking around that as well. I know security is a, something that's very important to the right. IBM Systems Division. Right, absolutely. So uh, the first thing that happens when someone hears about quantum computing is they ask about quantum security. <laughs> and as you can imagine, there's a lot of clients here that are concerned about security. So uh, in IBM research, we're also working on quantum safe encryption. So you got one team working on a quantum computer, you got another team ensuring that the data, is going, the data will be protected from the quantum computer. So we do believe that we can construct quantum safe encryption algorithms based on lattice-based technology that will allow us to encrypt data today and in the future when the quantum computer does reach that kind of capacity, the data will be protected. So the idea is we would start using these new algorithms far earlier then the computer could actually achieve this result, but it would mean that data created today would be you know, quantum safe in the future. You're kind of in your own so, arms race <laughs> internally. <so> it's like, <laughs> but it's very important, both aspects are very important. 
to be able to solve these problems that we can't solve today, which is really amazing, right? And to also be able to protect our data should it be used in, you know, inappropriate ways, right? Now, uh, we had Ed Walsh on earlier today. You used to run the storage uh, uh, division. What's yeah. going on in that world? I know you've got your, you know, your, 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 your hands in that pie as well. What, what, what can you tell us about well, what's going I, on Well, I there? believe that Ed and the team have done, made some phenomenal innovations in the past year around flash, NVMe technology, and fusing that across the product line, the state of the art. Uh, the other area that I think is particularly interesting, of course, is their data management strategy around things like Spectrum Discover. So today we all know that many of our clients have just huge amounts of data. I visited a client last year that, interesting enough, had one million tapes. And of course, we sell tapes, so that's a good thing. But then how do you deal and manage all the data that's on one million tapes? So one of the inventions that the team has worked on is a metadata tagging uh, capability that they've now shipped in a product called Spectrum Discover. And that allows a, a client to have a, a better way to uh, have a profile of their data, data governance, and understand for different uh, use cases like uh, data governance or compliance, how do they pull back the right data? And, and what does this data really mean to them? So have a better lexicon of their data, if you will, than what they can do in today's world. So I think that's very important that's technology. Interesting. I would imagine that metadata could sit in flash somewhere and then inform the serial technology um, to maybe find stuff faster. Yeah. I mean, everybody thinks tape is slow because it's sequential, yeah. but actually if you do some interesting things with yeah. metadata, yeah. you can... There's all kinds of things you can do. I mean, it's uh, one thing to have a data ocean, if you will, but then how do you really get value out of that data over a long period of time? Mm. And uh, I think we're just the tip of the spear in understanding the use cases that we can use this technology for. Yeah. Jamie, how, how does IBM manage that pipeline of innovation? I think uh, you know, we heard very specific examples of how the supercomputers drive HPC yeah. architectures, which everybody's going to use for their AI infrastructure. Yeah. Something like quantum computing is a little bit more out there. Yes. So how do you balance kind of the, the research through the, the, the product and what's, what's going to be uh, more useful to users today? Yeah, well that's an interesting question. So IBM is one of the few organizations in the world really that have an applied research organization still. Mm -hmm. And Dario Gill is here this week. He manages our research organization now under Arvind Krishna. Um, a, an organization like IBM Systems has a great relationship with research. So research are the folks that had people working on quantum for decades, right? And they're the reason that we are in a position now to be able to apply this in the way that we are. Uh, the great news is, is that you know, along the way, we're always working on a pipeline of this next generation set of technologies and innovations. Some of them succeed and some of them, some of them don't. But without doing that, we would not have things like quantum. We would not have advanced uh, encryption capability that we pushed all the way down into our chips. We would not have quantum safe encryption. Um, things like the metadata tagging that I talked about came out of IBM Research. So it's working with them on problems that we see coming down the pipe, if you will, that will affect our clients, and then working with them to make sure we get those into the product lines at the right amount of time. I would say that Quantum is the ultimate uh, partnership between IBM Systems and IBM Research. We have one team, in this case, that are working jointly on this product, uh, bringing the skills to bear that each of us have in this case, with them having the quantum physics experts and us having the electronics experts, and of course the software uh, stack spanning both organizations. It's really a great partnership. Is there anything you could tell us about what's going on at the edge? Um, the edge computing, you hear a lot about that today. Yeah. Yeah. IBM's, you know, it's got some activities going on yeah. there. You haven't made huge splashes there, but anything going on in research that you can share with us, or any directions? Well, I believe the edge is going to be a, a, a practical endeavor for us, and what I mean by that is there's certain use cases that I think we can serve very well. So if we look at the edge as perhaps a factory environment, we are seeing opportunities for our storage and compute solutions around uh, the, the data management out in some of these uh, areas. If you look at um, uh, the, the self-driving automobile, for instance, just to design something like that, can easily take over 100 petabytes of data. So being able to manage the data at the edge, uh, being able to then to provide insight appropriately using AI technologies is something we think we can do, and we see that. Um, I own factories based on what I do, and I'm starting to use AI technology. I use Power AI technology in my factories for visual inspection. Think about a lot of the uh, challenges around provenance of 
parts as well as making sure that they're finally put together uh, in the right way. Um, you know, using these kind of technologies in factories is just really uh, an easy use case that we can see. And so what we anticipate is we will work with uh, the other parts of IBM that are focused on edge as well and understand which mm. areas we think our technology can best serve. That's interesting, you mentioned visual inspection. That's an analog yeah. use case, which now you're yeah. transforming into digital. Yeah, well Power AI Vision has been very successful in the last uh, year. So we had this Power AI package of open source software that we pulled together, but we, we made it, we drastically simplified the use of this software, if you will, the ability to use it and deploy it. And we've added vision capability to it in last year. Mm -hmm. And there's many use cases for this vision uh, capability. If you think about even the case where you have a patient that is uh, in an uh, MRI, if you're able to, um, you're able to decrease the amount of time they stay in the, the MRI in some cases by uh, less fidelity of the, the picture, but then you've got to be able to interpret it. So this kind of uh, you know, AI and then extensions of AI to vision is really important. Um, another example um, for Power AI Vision is we're actually seeing uh, use cases in advertising. So the use case of at maybe you're at a sporting event or even uh, a busy place like this where you're able to use visual inspection techniques to understand the use of certain products. In the case of a sporting event, it's how many times did my logo show up in this sporting event, right? Um, particularly our favorite one is Formula One, which uh, we usually feature the Formula One uh, folks here a little bit at the event. So you can see how that kind of technology can be used to, to help advertisers understand the benefits in these cases. Got it. Well, Jamie, we always love having you on because you have visibility into so many different areas. And we really thank you for coming and sharing uh, a little taste of what's to come. Appreciate it. Well, thank you. It's always good to see you. and. I know it'll be a exciting week here. Yeah, we, we're very excited. Day zero here, day one, and uh, we're kicking off four days of coverage with theCUBE. Jamie Thomas of IBM. I'm Dave Vellante, he's Stu Miniman. We'll be right back, right after this short break from IBM Think in Moscone. <laughs>